Hello and welcome back to the third row. We have a monster on the bench today. It's a Merklin 3102 I bought recently. I have one of these in the collection already. Uh, there it is. And you might remember it from a Deutsche Reichsbahn themed session I published on the channel a while back. I put a little link at the top. In that video I had mentioned that it was not in the best condition, with quite a few bits and pieces broken off or missing. This new arrival should be in better shape, but I already know it has a few cosmetic issues based on the listing photos. So I would consider it a gamble, and in this video I shall find out whether it turns out to be a mistake. I'm writing my script as I go along, so at this stage I have no clue. One thing is sure is that whatever happens, I will need to take it apart, which on its own might be of interest to some of you. So if you'd like, you can stay with me for a bit as I hopefully get this model ready for the track. Before we set off, if you end up liking this video and you want to support the channel, please be sure to hit the like, subscribe and alert button before leaving today. Super thanks are also available if you feel the content deserves it. Whatever the option you choose will be much appreciated. Many, many thanks! Now, on to our model. This 3102 represents a BR-53, a 1943 war locomotive design by Borsig, meant for use in Russia. It sounds like someone still hadn't got the memo about Stalingrad back then. The class was never built, and all documentation was long thought to have been destroyed. The story goes that Merklin got its hands on the plans by accident during a visit at the Deutsche Bundesbahn archives. The seller listed the model as an as-new item, but the pictures told another story. It has a few cosmetic defects, which might turn out to be just dirt, but we'll soon find out. The box is ok, it has a few tears, but still does its job, so it's nothing to whinge about too much here. We have a complete set of instructions, which is excellent. Now let me get the model out. Look at this beast of an engine. This model was a bit of a throw of the dice for Merklin. It was designed at a time the industry was just coming out of recession. Merklin was trying to tap into the emerging market of collectors. Despite being based on a prototype that was never built, this model became a bestseller and quickly earned its place among the Merklin classics. And it didn't come cheap. This was the most expensive HO locomotive Merklin had in the program for a long time after its release in 1979. To give you an idea, it sold for 260 Deutschmark at launch. At the time, the average monthly German salary was 2350 Deutschmark. Take 30% off in tax, that would have left about 1650 Deutschmark before any expenses such as rent, utilities, car, food, etc. etc. As we are talking about averages here, it was simply out of reach for the majority of people, and something they could only dream of owning one day. So it is not surprising that for many who grew up at that time, this model is a must-have, and still today, and the prices reflect this. The model has developed quite a following over the years, which Merklin catered to with many releases in all sorts of variations over the last four decades. So this model is in good shape on this side. There doesn't seem to be anything wrong, maybe a bit of dust. Now let's flip it over, and here the story should be a bit different. Tender and cab both look fine, the boiler looks ok too, we've got a few white bits here and there, but there I think it is just dust from the packaging. 
We have a few issues further up though. We have some funny marks on the wind deflectors, which look suspiciously like rust bubbling up from under the paint. And if we look at the valve gear, we have a bit of rust on a couple of links too. That I am less worried about, but it is something I need to look at. Now, carrying on and looking at the chassis, unless someone found a way for this model to run on track without leaving its box, it is clear that it has been used, and enough to accumulate crud on its wheels. So, it is definitely not new. Looking at the tender, we have a bit of rust developing on the buffers and coupling too. Now, let's find out if it works. The wheels are all free. So, let's put this thing on the track and see what's going on. That's it. Moment of truth. Let's try the reverser first. And we heard the familiar clicks. That's good. Now, let's give it some power. So we're going backwards and forwards. The lights are working at the front and at the back. So it's all good. I wasn't expecting this. The model doesn't sound too bad either. So by the looks of it, this locomotive needs a minor service, maybe a change of tires. I need to fix the rusty bits on the chassis and tender. I'm going to do this first and then I look at the boiler and the wind deflector. So it's time to get the tools out. Dismantling the locomotive is quite easy. We need to remove a few screws. The first one is hidden under a plastic insert near the cab. This insert should just pull out, no tools needed. There we are. I'll come back to the screw later once I've removed the two additional screws located under the leading wheels. There, the truck has to come out first so they can be reached. And with the truck out of the way, the two screws can come off. Cool. Everything came out easily as well. No sign of congealed oil here. I'll remove the body screw near the cab now. And the body simply lifts off. Super. Now let's have a look at the chassis for a bit. If you were considering converting one of these models to digital, you notice that there is no space in this locomotive, which is a bit surprising considering its size. Uh, space is so tight that the motor plate is fitted upside down. This is to avoid shorts against the locomotive body. Another unusual thing for a model of this vintage is the long duct in the center of the casting. It hides a few wires, one for the front lighting and the smoke generators, and we also have a ground connection wire. Now this is needed because the motor side of the articulated chassis doesn't provide a good enough ground connection. So ground is picked up from the front, but it's not the only connection. We also have ground pickups under the tender, connected to the usual ground solder tag attached to the bottom screw on the uh, motor cover plate. So this should give a hint as to how ground 
connectivity can easily get interrupted on this model. This is even more important in digital than in analog. So, in my opinion, this is not a model suited for a first try at a digital conversion. Carrying on with the inspection on the tender, uh, we have a bit of rust on the buffer, as I mentioned earlier, but I'm not sure they are made of metal, so that might simply wipe off later. We'll see. We have more rust on the valve gear under the motor too. So while I'm in the area, I'm going to have a peek at the motor. Because the cover plate is wired from both sides in two opposite directions, it can be easily flipped to one side on this model. So I need to tilt it away from the housing towards me in this case. The motor housing and armature are a bit dirty, but nothing major by the looks of it. So I'll start by cleaning the motor while I'm here. Well, the inside of the cover plate was quite dirty after all. The armature is more of the same, but under this dirt the collectors look very good. I'll take care of the gaps between segments too here. Then I'll lubricate the armature ends and put the motor back together. Now let's look at the wheels. The traction tires are all loose. Surprise, surprise. So we'll need to take the valve gear off to change them, which is good because I need to take care of the rust there too. I'll start by removing the retaining screw for the top side of the valve gear assembly on the chassis. Then I loosen the bolt holding the crank. That's using the largest X driver from the Merklin tool set. The assembly then simply slides out. And with it out of the way, the remaining rod can be unscrewed, this time using the middle-sized hex driver from the Merklin tool set. That all just needs to be repeated on the other side too. Now the traction tires are accessible and can be pulled out. They are definitely past their best. I'll clean the tire grooves in the wheels to give the new tires a chance to do their job properly. And I'll fit some new tires. They are 7153 on this model. Cool. Now let's take care of the rusty valve gear assemblies. I'll just show you one of them as it is the same for all. I use some metal polish. Here it is auto sole because that's what I have. But any similar polish for automotive bright work will do the trick. I'll apply a tiny bit to the rusty links. And then I use my Dremel with the polishing pad on the lowest speed setting and gently go over the surface of the rusty chromed parts whilst avoiding touching the painted sections. Now the same could be done with the cotton bud and a bit of elbow grease, just not as fast. Et voilà! And then it is just a matter of reattaching the rod, then slide the assembly into the cylinders. That's one of the fiddliest bits to do. Then reattaching the crank, followed by another fiddly bit, reattaching the bolt. Et 
and once that is done, quickly check that nothing gets stuck before fastening the assembly screw to the chassis. And the job will be done. As we have the polish out, we'll take care of the leading wheels and most importantly those on the tender. This can be levered out with the tip of a screwdriver, but this needs to be done very gently. The bogies are made of 40-year-old plastic that can be a bit brittle. I've had some coming apart in the past on this type of tender. Then it is the same process as for the valve gear. Apply a tiny bit of polish, then buff the surfaces with a polishing pad and Dremel at the lowest speed setting. And after a quarter of an hour doing that, we'll get to this result. Much better! Note that I also polished the axles as best as I could. Now, the axles simply need to be pushed back in place on the tender. Gently again. Yeah, definitely much better looking now. Right, on to more rust. The coupling is cleaning up nicely with just a bit of WD-40. I might repaint it for a more permanent effect, but that all depends on what I do with the body, so I won't break the paintbrushes out just yet. Now let's have a look at those buffers. I don't think they are metal. Let me try and wipe them with WD-40 too. How easy was that? Super! They are like new. I cleaned the front coupling too, the same way. And the spring. After all, the loco needs all the ground contact it can get. OK, that's done. OK, now we can turn our attention to the body. We have some white deposits all over the place. So I'm going to try some WD-40 on a cotton bud first to see what happens. Now that is definitely taking some stuff off, but there's quite a bit left on the body. So I think I need to be a bit more aggressive here. So I'm going to give the body a wash in lukewarm soapy water and see what happens. Now I can't do this here in the garage, so one moment please. Well, here we are and the body is clean, but we have a few issues. If we look at the top of the boiler, we can see little circular imprints in the paint. I think what is happening here is that the styrofoam of the packaging has reacted and fused to the paint over time. No amount of cleaning is going to fix that. This is such a shame. Now, it's not the first time I come across this sort of things and I have taken to routinely wrap items in tissue paper before putting them back in their packaging to prevent this type of damage. Now, I have an option which would be to swap this body with the one on the other locomotive as its paint is in better shape. I could swap the cabs and foot plates, I think, because they are simply clipped on, if I remember well. Let's try that. Now, the foot plate inserts come off by unclipping the ends on both sides of the cab and lifting them, then inserting a screwdriver in the holes to lever and lift the middle of the insert out and gently prying the front end with the steps away from the boiler and lifting it. This might need a bit of very gentle persuasion. OK. Now, the cab. I should be able to push the clip under the roof, 
but it seems not to want to submit. Now let me have a closer look off camera. I don't want to break anything. One moment, please. And we are back. This cab has been resisting me and refuses to move. I was about to try something a bit more aggressive, but I took a deep breath and a step back and I had a thought and I decided not to proceed. The risk this could cause more harm than good was too high based on past experience, so I have decided to give up. I toyed with swapping the wind deflector as well, but there is no point given the overall state of the body. So I have put the other locomotive back together already. Here it is, back to her old self. And I have reattached the foot plates on this body. And now I'm just going to use a tiny bit of ballistol, that's oil on a soft cloth to try and give the boiler a bit of a sheen and see if it makes the imperfection a bit less noticeable. So I'll just apply the oil over the body and then I'll buff the excess off with a dry part of the cloth. Well, that is not too bad. Uh, I've had a strong light uh, beaming against this thing since the beginning of the video. So it should look better under normal lighting on the track. That light really reveals every single little thing. OK, it's time to put everything back together. So I'll reattach the body first. One thing to pay particular attention to are the smoke generator contacts. They need to be inserted in a square compartment under the chimneys in the boiler, making sure the two contacts are inside it. The back one can easily get trapped and damaged if uh, it's not carefully done. And the end of the light diffuser at the front needs to also go inside like so and with this in place we should be perfectly aligned for the top body screw and we are so i'll fit the screw and the cap and then i'll reattach the front body screws then the coupling, there's a little hook at the front that needs to slide into a slot at the front of the chassis. Then I can put the truck back on and the screw. That part is done. All that is left now as far as putting things together is the back coupling. We just need to make sure that the spring is positioned properly behind it. There we go, little washer and screw, all done. Now, one thing I haven't done yet is lubrication. So I do that on the axles, a drop of oil on all the bearings, and I put a drop of oil on the gears. That's not a mere clean thing. I do this to try and attenuate the gear noise a bit. I found it works for me. Okay, we are done. It's time to send the loco for a running now. We're off. Well, it doesn't look too bad from here. Right, I'll let it run for 10 minutes, 
and come back. One moment, please. Right, the run is finished. I have put together a mixed freight train to finish the video. We have 15 cars, I think. And the loco looks quite all right under normal lighting too. So it's not such a bad mistake, but it's still a mistake. I have scavenged a few smoke generator too. They are the largest one. Uh, Merklin would sell those as 7226 and Zoiter or Soother, as they say in English, would be number 10. So I'm going to pop this in. There we go. Then I'll drop a tiny bit of smoke fluid on the pipe to test them. Let me give them a pulse of current. Yeah, they both work. Okay, so I can fill them now. That's the usual two milliliters. And now we can get the logo attached to the train. We'll go very slowly. Very nice. And now we'll send it on its way. So we're going to go straight for the main line. The long train doesn't seem to be a problem for the beast. Uh, we are running at throttle setting 110, 120-ish. We have smoke, but it looks like only one of the smoke generators is actually generating any. I won't troubleshoot this now because the two generators are of different vintages. I think one is a year old and the other one is probably 40 years old. So one of them might need a bit more current than the other. But we have smoke, which is what matters. The locomotive really doesn't look too bad. So we're getting to the ramp. Hey, not bad at all. Oh, good. So, let's watch it for a bit. Now, this locomotive was a gamble and it turned out to be a mistake. At least as far as the collection is concerned. But I think it makes up for it 
with bags full of potential for hours of worry-free fun. So, we have reached the end of this installment. Thank you very much for spending so much of your time with me today. I hope you enjoyed the video. Hopefully enough for you to give it a like. Maybe even subscribe if you haven't already done so. Or even send a super thanks my way if you feel the video was worth it. Thanks as ever for all your support and bye for now.